Farid Isak from the University of Johannesburg says Joburg has the most cult, followed by Durban and then to a lesser extent Cape Town. For more insight on how these cults operate, we now have Professor Isak joining us on the line from Johannesburg. Prof, thank you very much for joining us on SABC News. Now, the Seven Angels Ministry was recently in the news for the gruesome murder of police officers in Ngobo. Was that the true reflection of how cults operate? Uh, well, uh, certainly not murder, certainly not uh, criminality to this extent, um, but the underlying issues of isolating your members from the larger community, uh, owing an undying allegiance to a particular individual, and in this case, um, a mother and uh, a family, uh, cutting off the members from uh, other members of the community, uh, literally owning the lives <clears throat> and the will and the thoughts of uh, its uh, members. These are typical characteristics of cults, and we see it uh, exhibited uh, inside the Seven Angels uh, Ministry. Uh, there was, however, pretty different from how most religious cults work, here was a clear use of the so-called religious ideas um, for acts of criminality. It had nothing to do with sustaining the members of the community or giving them a deeper meaning, but everything to do with the power of uh, the seven brothers and uh, their mother. So in some respects, it is different from how cults operate. Um, and all cults, in some ways, are very, very unique. But the broader characteristics of how cults are defined, yes, certainly, it fits into, uh, well into that uh, definition. Prof, I'm actually glad you mentioned communities, but I wanted to touch on that a little bit later on. Let's look at what attracts people <coughs> to cults such as these. Um, well, often uh, in, in completely urban settings, it is uh, alienated individuals, uh, often dysfunctional, uh, people with deeply, uh, with deep uh, and unaddressed psychological uh, problems, um, and they find expression for many of the unresolved issues. Uh, they find it uh, in, through living vicariously through uh, the group and finding uh, meaning and belonging uh, inside this group. This is often the case in, uh, in urban uh, settings where um, a person in a middle-class family, for example, or belonging to the better of communities, they find uh, solace inside uh, these groups. Uh, in poorer communities, it functions slightly different. The cults can offer you a, both a sense of belonging, but also look after your, uh, your more immediate material needs. So there are both psychological as well as social factors that could drive people uh, into a cult. Um, and people also believe that um, in the face of difficulties around them, which are either inexplicable or in the face of um, ordeals um, that they simply can't deal with, that uh, it is easier to hand your will over to a larger uh, charismatic or what you may want to term a prophetic figure. It's pretty much the same reason, I mean, why people, uh, often when people have been in jail for a very long time, when they come out of jail, uh, they commit crimes in order to get back because they don't have the skills to deal with the real world uh, out there. So people um, are uncomfortable with very many things in their personal life. They feel they can't cope. Um, inside this uh, cult, they, are, they lead a regimented life. Uh, they date uh, the, the times of waking up, of eating, of praying. The entire 24 hours is monitored and regulated for them, so they can transfer responsibilities for their lives that they can't manage on their own, they transfer on to the, uh, to the guru uh, or to this uh, rabbi or to this uh, imam or pastor or prophet, whatever the different uh, leaders of these uh, sects may want to uh, call themselves. Prof, let's look at the vulnerability of communities. How easy is it for cults such as these to infiltrate vulnerable or previously disadvantaged communities specifically? Um, 
No, I mean, the statistics, uh, well, first of all, it's very, di- very uh, difficult and there are various definitions of, of what cults are. But a country like the United States, for example, um, has in, cult- in literature on the religious cults, a country like the United States, which is a relatively economically developed country, uh, to put it mildly, um, it has by far percentage-wise the most cults. Um, of countries where in uh, the phenomenon of cults have been studied. So it, um, it manifests itself differently in different kinds of uh, economically uh, developed or underdeveloped societies. Um, uh, but uh, one can't really say that it is much more prevalent in uh, poorer communities. Um, they may go more unnoticed in, poor, in poorer communities, because generally, everything in poorer communities get more unnoticed. Um, but the prevalence, there's no proof to indicate that it is more prevalent amongst poorer communities than in more economically developed communities. Now, Prof, just finally, can the state intervene? And what powers does it have to stop some of the dangerous and violent cults, the Seven Angels Ministry, like the Seven Angels Ministry, rather? Well, um, the state can only intervene uh, in two cases, really, because other than uh, the constitutionally entrenched right of freedom of religion, there is also the constitutionally entrenched right of freedom of association. When the state gets information that anybody is held against his or her will by the cult, or on the premises of the cult, then the state can intervene. The difficulty is, when you go there, in all likelihood, this person uh, may say that I'm here willingly. It's pretty much uh, when somebody else goes in a case of uh, abuse, of domestic abuse, in the house next door, and the police rock up there, and this woman, terrified of her husband, tells uh, the police that, no, I'm not being abused at the moment. Although, of course, uh, the gender violence laws in our country do make provisions now for the fact that in this particular case, uh, the police can still intervene despite this woman saying that no, she's not abused. So that law may be extended to uh, this kind of abuses by cult or the, uh, the prevention uh, by cult leaders of access to outsiders. But one area where the state can definitely intervene, and this was the case um, uh, nearly two years ago, uh, with the um, with the Mahogo, uh, Seven Angels Ministry, where children uh, were being uh, held by the cult, and and regardless of whether the parents had given uh, consent for the children to be kept on the cult premises or not, uh, the social welfare department has intervened in the past. So in the case of minors, the state has a very clear jurisdiction, um, both constitutionally and, uh, and in law. Uh, in the case of adults, uh, the state has a much more difficult task in proving that people are being held against their, uh, their will. But uh, there are possibilities, but then only in the cases where there has actually been violence done against uh, the members of the scout, where there's a possibility that legislation can be enacted. If there's no proof of violence, and we're not talking about mental coercion or emotional violence, we're talking about physical violence. Um, if there's no clear proof of physical violence being enacted by the cult, I'm afraid um, the constitutional provisions of freedom of association, um, they're very, very strong. And uh, there is quite literally nothing that the state can do if an individual decides that he or she is going to be wedded or tied or enslaved uh, to these cults and their leaders. Prof, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you very much for joining us on SABC News. That was Professor Isak from the Department of Religious Studies at the University of Johannesburg. Now, a young